Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. Once again, my name is Jesse Day. We are continuing with our pre-VRIC summit, counting down to the VRIC January 21st and 22nd. And this time, my guest is the Director of Marketing and Communications at Midnight Sun Mining, a company focused on exploring and developing copper on their flagship Solwezi project located in Zambia, Adrian O'Brien. Welcome to the Pre-VRIC Summit. Excellent, Jesse. Really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us on and, and excited to tell you about this project today. Yes, excited to hear about it. So let's start with a bit of an overview because the Midnight Sun story seems to have all the right ingredients, a large project in the world's number two copper producing belt, Africa's biggest copper mine right next door. You're surrounded by world-class mines, major producers, so talk to us about the geology at your project, the Solwezi licenses, and why this all has your team excited. For sure. So to start off with, we've been working in this area for almost 10 years. Um, might even be a little over 10 years at this point. So we've been in, in Zambia for a long time. And if you look at the world's copper districts, there's, you know, there are, there's different districts with different types of deposits, right? So you have the classic porphyry deposits that have been mined for years and years and years. And you have areas like Zambia or like the Zambian Congo Copper Belt, where we are, that are predominantly SEDEX deposits. Um, so these are much, much bigger deposits than the traditional copper porphyries that people are used to hearing about being produced. And uh, anyways, we've been in Zambia for a long time. We have 506 square kilometers, which is astronomical. I mean, it's a massive, massive project. And I think that's one of the hardest things to get across is the scale of this thing, right? How big it actually is. Um, but if you can imagine, it's basically split into uh, kind of four or five different areas. And each of these deposits are, are not deposits, but projects, if you will, are pieces of the property. Each of those are located in geology that could be unique unto themselves and have a multi-generational copper deposit. So you essentially have four or five different separate chances at a multi-generational copper deposit. And this area is known for hosting copper deposits that are in excess of a billion tons. These are 100 billion pound copper deposits. These are not your typical copper porphyry. They eclipse anything you can imagine in BC, Arizona, US, uh, Chile. I mean, these are massive, massive copper deposits. Um, to give you an idea of the landscape, can, you mentioned uh, one of the top African copper producers, that's Kinsanchi, owned by First Quantum. That's six kilometers away from our property. And we're literally side by side. We basically surround them to the west and around to the south. You have uh, Barrick's Lamwana Mine, which has become the predominant focus for Barrick. I mean, Mark Bristow has not been even slightly shy about saying that copper is a big focus for Barrick going forward. Zambia is the area that they want to focus, and Lamwana is their flagship. Um, so Lamwana is just a little further to the west of us. Then beside Lamwana, you have First Quantum Sentinel Mine, also very large, and it plays a big part in our story due to some recent drill results. And then just to the north of us, you have Ivanhoe's Kamoa Kakula, which is the biggest, baddest copper deposit pretty well ever seen. Um, and all of these things basically surround us. So we are nestled like right in the center of one of the top copper belts in the world. And we are truly an elephant country as far as big copper deposits. So we're, we're in the right place. Well, maybe you could provide some more color there on what differentiates Zambia's domes region and your project if we're comparing them to other copper projects globally, maybe outside of Zambia as well. Sure. I mean, really what you're looking at are copper deposits that are much larger, right? So they're, these SEDEX deposits tend to be, um, you know, they can be tilted at different orientations, but they're typically kind of a flat lying deposit. They may not, may not have the thicknesses of a porphyry, but they do have the size and scale on a strike kind of uh, level. So when you're looking at these things, they go for a long distance. They're very, very, very large. And again, it just comes down to scale. When you're looking at these, these aren't 10 year, 12 year, 15 year mine life. These are, you know, 30, 50, 80 year, they're multi-generational and could go on forever and ever and ever. These are, you know, like I said, 100 billion pound copper deposits. And so when you look at copper porphyry deposits globally, you're looking at a situation where most of the big ones have been found. Um, there's not a lot of brand new big, when I talk big, I'm talking multi-generational copper porphyries left to be found. Um, those that are, are mired in political issues or, you know, a lot of difficulty in terms of cost and CapEx up front. And so what the copper sector is doing is moving towards different methodologies for extraction. So they're looking at block cave, 
Um, they're looking at different ways of getting at these porphyries, underground models. And the difficulty with that is cost. So when you look at the capex to take something like a block cave model for a copper porphyry, something with a high grade core, you're looking at massive capex to get these into production. And, and when I say that, we're talking over $500 million, might be a billion dollar capex. If it's block cave, all that cost is going to be upfront. So you don't have time to get that paid back. You got to lay down that money right up front. And that becomes extremely cost prohibitive for companies to get these big projects into production. When you look at something like a Zambian Congo Copper Belt, these are big deposits, but in the situation of Midnight Sun, we're surrounded by world-class producers. And what that means is we don't even need to arm wave that we're going to go into production. The reality is we are not. We're not aiming to become a producer. We're developing deposits. We're developing these assets that we have to the point where one of the you know regionally close by uh, mines is going to take that for feed for their mine. And when it comes to First Quantum's Consanchi mine, there's a number of different reasons why that's super important. Um, if you look at regional consolidation in Zambia and what might be happening in the Domes region, um, our property becomes one of the absolute critical pieces that there is. Yeah, I love that you're very clear on your goals there. You do not intend to go into production. Um, no. It's it's very, yeah, it's very good to hear that that you have a clear pathway that you're working towards. So what about the status of mines nearby? Because oftentimes acquisition activity is driven by a need for feed as mines with their own production facilities become less productive. So is that dynamic present where you are? Yeah. So let's use Consanchi as the example. Now, Lamwana has been the subject of a lot of work by Barrick. Um, over the last couple of years, Barrick has really unlocked the secret to Lamwana and making it work size, scale. Um, so Lamwana is going to keep going for a long time. Um, but let's look specifically at Consanchi. Consanchi has two interesting situations. Number one, they've been in production for quite a long time. They are getting, wouldn't say they're near the end of mine life, but they're getting down there. They're certainly getting deep. They're getting to the point where they need more feed. But one of their interesting situations actually relates to their production facility itself. And that is a byproduct of their smelter is sulfuric acid. And when you look at the overage of sulfuric acid that they have, Typically, uh, at a North American project or something maybe in Europe, you would ship that sulfuric acid off the property. Um, there's different ways to dispose of it or utilize it in different industries. In this area, that's not really viable. So what they do is they use oxide copper ore. Now, oxide copper ore, for anybody that's not familiar, it's the same stuff as what you have down deeper where it's sulfides, but it's been oxidized. So the material is, is more broken up. It's a different kind of material at surface. And that's typically the top part of the stratigraphy that you're dealing with at the mine or in the, on the property. And if you look at a, an area like Midnight Sun or like property like we have, we have oxide material all over our property. And so what you see is uh, First Quantum is looking at an area like ours for feed, for oxides to treat their sulfuric acid and actually to get to use it up and get rid of it. So what they do is they heap leach their oxide material with sulfuric acid that gets rid of the sulfuric acid, gives them a secondary byproduct or a secondary product of their mine, and it becomes economically viable and they get rid of the sulfuric acid at the same time. But now they're running out. And so by uh, beginning of 2024, Consanchi is gonna have no more oxide ore to utilize. And the next best source of oxide ore is Midnight Sun's property. Um, so we're actually starting a scoping study right now, or maybe not a scoping study, but a study in itself where we're going to go across our property. We're going to do significant shallow drilling, and we're going to go to areas where we know that there's oxide ore and see if we can tally up somewhere in the range of 50 million tons at 0.3%. Assuming we can, that would give First Quantum the amount of uh, oxide ore that they need, or whoever owns that mine uh, going forward, gives them the amount of oxide ore that they need to go forward. And it would basically be a turnkey mining operation for Midnight Sun, um, which would you know, produce somewhere in excess of 15 or $20 million a year in revenue. Um, so you know, it's one of the pieces of what we're looking at. It's a smaller piece in terms of the bigger picture, but it's a really interesting, um, it's an interesting angle and it's certainly a sweetener for the exploration side of our story. Well, let's focus there now on what your exploration on the project has shown to date, because I know there were some signs of good mineralization shown by past work. Could you give us an update and, and an overview of that part of uh, the puzzle? 
For sure. So as I said at the beginning of the interview, you can kind of take our property and break it up in four or five different pieces. And to explain it, kind of working around the face of a clock, you'd have down to the southeast, you have something called Dumbwa. Okay, so Dumbwa would be our flagship. And what makes Dumbwa unique is it's a surface geochemical anomaly. And so when you look at this area, there's typically quite a bit of cover, right? There's quite a bit of soil and there's vegetation. Zambia is quite green. Um, it's not desert like a lot of other parts of Africa. And so you have a lot of cover over the ground. You don't see a lot of bedrock and you have to rely on geochemical analysis in order to see if there's elevated copper values and whether you're on the right track. So what Dumbwa is, is a 20 kilometer long soil anomaly. So it's the largest soil anomaly um, of its kind in Africa. And it's a 20 kilometer long soil anomaly that assays up to 0.728% copper. Now that may not sound staggering to some people if they're not familiar with the region, but to, to give you kind of some context, the average mine in this area is about 0.5, 0.6%. So when you're seeing 0.7 in soils, not even in bedrock, but in soils over a 20 kilometer distance, that is really significant. Um, so we have a big structure there. And uh, last summer, uh, another company working the region that was a major, um, so a, a very, very large company, drilled a discovery hole right off the boundary of that property to the south. And that kind of set the area, um, you know, brought a lot of attention, let's put it that way. And uh, there became a lot of buzz and we started to receive a lot of interest in our property. And so Dumbwa is our primary focus right now. There's something big going on down there. We don't know what it is. It's in the right geology. It's in the right place. It sits in almost a, a perfect line with Kinsanchi. So it sits directly south of the Kinsanchi pit. Um, and it's a very, very large target. So that's our primary focus. Then a little to the west, we have something called Me Too. And Me Too is another really interesting property. There's a different type of geology. And as I mentioned, each of these areas has the potential to be a multi-generational deposit. So they're kind of separate areas in themselves. Um, Me Too is a really great area geologically. We did uh, a lot of drilling there in 2022. And what we did last year was we actually reassayed some of the core. We got great results back um, in excess of 1% copper. And so we got those back and thought, we should run these again. We should see what they come back with, make sure that they're carrying the kind of numbers that we're seeing and kind of get a little bit more context. And we decided to run a couple of holes that we'd never run before. We got those results in the summer. Um, back in July, we announced them. And basically we ended up with better results than we had the first time around. And the most interesting thing that we came back with was that at Me Too, we have, we've always said it was a Lamwana lookalike. So I mentioned Barracks Lamwana Mine to the West. We always thought that that was what we were dealing with at Me Too. But what came back was a different suite of metals. We had copper, we had cobalt, we had nickel, and we actually had some anomalous gold. And where you see that is at Sentinel, which is even further to the West. And so now we have a brand new analog. And so what comes out of that is proof of concept, separate system from Dumois, two different things, two different types of geology, completely different analog. And now we know that we're looking at a Sentinel type deposit and we can approach that with the right methodology. Um, then moving a little further to the north, over on that western side, we have something called the crunch zone or the western flank. That's another area we've done predominantly geophysics, very little drilling there, um, but we will get back and do some drilling at western flank at some point. And then to the north, we have something called Kaziba in the 22 zone. And that's where we've done probably the most work um, in terms of drilling. There is something large going on there. That's the closest thing we have to the Kinsanchi mine. They sit right across from one another. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a really, really great target. We've had lots of great drill intervals there, lots of oxides, discovery holes, if you will, but we haven't found the big system yet. And so we want to get back there and do, you know, as much significant work as we can. Talk to us about Zambia in general as a jurisdiction, because obviously every jurisdiction has pluses and minuses. So how do you find working in Zambia and what is your relationship like with the local government and community? Well, so Zambia is phenomenal. Um, this is an area that I think people overlook how big copper export is there. This is 75% of their export earnings. Um, so Zambia is a copper mining country, copper focused. Um, they do have a new democratically elected government that's been in place now for a couple of years. And they are totally mining centric, mining focused. They're doing everything they can to push the mining industry forward. Um, so it's, it's fantastic that way. They have proper mining law. They have, um, you know, proper jurisdiction over the mining sector. 
And when you look at the area where we are, like Solwazi in particular, um, it's a small town, but it's essentially a mining town. Everybody there works at one of the first quantum mines, um, you know, or there's other geologists coming there, of course, to go to the other areas, whether it's um, going north up to Kamoa Kakula or west to Barracks and Wana Mine or Sentinel. But you have people walking around proud to be in the mining sector, proud to be working for these mining companies. Working conditions are great. Um, the town is very developed. It's a it's a phenomenal place to work. So, you know, we're really happy in Zambia. It's a safe jurisdiction. So we always say as far as Africa goes, it doesn't get any easier than working in Zambia. So let's talk about next steps for the company. What's next for the project? What activities are planned? What should shareholders and potential investors be looking forward to? So right now, we, we decided a while ago that we needed to move this forward. Um, one of the hindrances that comes with a project of this size is simply exactly that. It's size and scale, right? 506 square kilometers. How do you systematically explore 500 kilometers of property and actually give each of these four or five targets their due amount of exploration? Um, it's very difficult, very cost you know, very costly, I guess, is the right way to put it. And so we decided that bringing a strategic in was the right way to go. Um, so we've been entertaining all kinds of offers and discussions over the last little while. Um, I think we're getting close to having the answer as to how that's going to look and what we're going to do. Um, we're making Dumbwa our number one focus. So our goal right now is to get Dumbwa financed. And essentially what you'll see us doing is taking those four or five different opportunities in different parts of the property, financing them independently, whether that's a joint venture, um, some type of strategic investment, or whether we go to the market and, uh, and raise capital on our own, we'll take each of those separately and advance each of those properties so that we properly and systematically explore them. Dumbwa is going to be the first one out of the gate. Um, you know, as I said, hopefully we'll have some clarity on that that we can talk about really, really soon. And, uh, and then we'll systematically finance and build out those other parts of the property and, uh, and really go after these things systematically and, and properly explore them, which is what they need. These take, you know, they, they take a lot of money. They take a lot of systematic drilling. We've done most of the geophysics and geochem we could ever want to do across the property. Really right now, it comes down to getting the drill bit in the ground and seeing what these things are like at depth and, and properly approaching them on that front. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Adrian, and sharing your knowledge on Midnight Sun Mining. Um, very fascinating project, and we look forward to keeping up to date on it as well. Excellent. Really appreciate it, Jesse.